One of the main uses of Venn diagrams is to solve survey problems, um, particularly in one of the main uses in this course. So here's what I've got. I've got a survey of 60 VC students, and I'm going to ask them three questions. Um, if you're a teacher like I am, these are things that keep you awake at night and you wonder about. One is, do I have students who earned an F or D in their last class? The other is, are students studying enough? If you have a three-unit class, you need to have 12 hours of study time that includes the, the three units of the lecture plus that class. And this online class, watching this video, is part of your uh, 12 hours, but you also have the study time and you have the prep of going through the exercises and all that. And then the other thing is, do the students feel comfortable enough to come to office hours? Uh, or in your cases, email me questions. And are the students interested in the course? If there's questions about some of the, the higher level ideas that are happening and how this would apply to the real world and what's really going on, do the students come and ask you those sorts of cool questions? Um, if you have all two of these things in play, then you don't usually see as much here, or if you do, it's something that's harder for a professor to change. So this is the kind of things you wonder about. And Venn diagrams can help you solve and find out information about this. So I asked these three questions in my survey to 60 students. And after I do that, this is the results that I get down here. And so here's what we're going to do. Since I've got three questions, what I've really got going on for me is a three-ringed Venn diagram. So as I'm drawing my, my Venn diagram here, trying to make sure that my rings are big enough as they can be. There we go. Fit a bunch of information into. Let's make this whole thing just a little bit bigger. There we go. All right. Now what I need to do is figure out what each of my rings is. The first ring is going to be the first question. So I'm going to call that A. The second ring is going to be the B information. Do people study enough? And the third ring is going to be C. Are people asking questions? Do they feel comfortable coming and talking to me? Now that we've got this, I want to fill in the three regions of my graph as best as possible and see who lives in what areas. We know from down here that in terms of people going to office hours, which we remember we called B, um, or we called C, excuse me, um, there's 25 people in this whole C region. But you don't start there. Because of the 25 total people who are in the C area, those students who are willing to go to office hours and ask questions, some of them fit into each of these four different spots that C is split up into. So here's what you do. You start off with the thing that describes the most specific information. Six students earned F and Ds, studied two to three hours per unit, and attended office hours. That means this region right here, common to all three of these questions, getting a yes answered, I had six people. Next, I know that 13 students earned F and Ds and studied appropriately. Remember, B was my appropriate studying question. So that tells me that there's 13 students in this region here. But of those 13, six of them are also part of coming to office hours. So 13 minus 6 gives me the 7 people who are just earning F's and D's, because they're in region A, and they're studying 2 to 3 hours per unit, but they're not part of the total 13 because these 7 don't come to office hours. Next, I've got 10 students earned F and Ds and went to office hours. Now I'm talking about this area. 10 students earn Fs and Ds, so they're in region A, and they go to office hours, and that makes them in region C. But again, while I've got 10 people in this region as a whole, six of those people also study appropriately, and so 10 minus 6 leaves me with only four people who are actually just going to office hours and are still having trouble in class. 11 students study and attend office hours. 
of those 11 students who are studying and attending office hours, they're in this area. But again, six of them are also having trouble with the class. So I do 11 minus 6, and this gives me the five people left who are only studying and going to office hours, and they're not having trouble with the class. Finally, I see that 26 students earned F and Ds in the class. Of those 26 students who are in this region A, earning Fs and Ds, what have I got? Well, seven of them are doing appropriate studying. Six of them are doing appropriate studying and coming to office hours. And four of them aren't spending enough time studying, but they are still coming to office hours. So I've got this 26 minus 7 minus 6 minus 4. I don't know, maybe that's 20 minus 7 minus 4. And maybe 20 minus 4 is going to leave me with 16 minus 7. And so that leaves me with 9. So what this tells me is that there's 9 students who are having trouble in my class, but who are not um, doing anything else. They're not trying to, they're not studying enough, because they, if they were studying enough, they'd be one of these seven. And of these nine students, I know that they're not coming to office hours either, because if they were, they'd be part of this four. So this nine doesn't represent all the people in A, it represents all the people who are just in A, just the people who are having trouble. I use the exact same logic to fill in the unique areas of B and C. 21 students are studying correctly. However, of those students who are studying correctly, seven of them are having trouble with the class, six of them are having trouble with the class, and they're still going to office hours as well, and five of them who are studying correctly are also going to office hours, and they're not having trouble in the class, so they're part of this group right here. And once I do those subtractions, I'm doing basically doing 21 minus 18, and that leaves me with three people. So there's three people who are studying correctly. They don't go to office hours, but they're still passing the class. They're not having trouble, so they're not in that A sector. And lastly, I've got for my Part C, I know that 25 students out of those 60 went to office hours, but that's 25 total. I have to subtract the 4 and the 6 and the 5. And once I do that, that leaves me with 10 students who went to office hours. They didn't study enough in terms of the official two to three hours per unit, but they still did okay in the class. Somehow they, they came and learned enough by talking with me and chatting with me that everything was going to work out okay. So now I've got my Venn diagram all worked out. I'm almost done. I've got one last area to talk about. And that's how many people are in the whole universe. All together inside this whole box, I had 60 people because I had 60 students all together. To fill in the rest of this box, I have to subtract all the different people from all the different parts. So if I clear myself some space here to do that with, we have to notice, be careful. I've got 60 students all together. And then what's happening? Well, I have to get rid of these nine. I have to get rid of the seven. I have to get rid of the three students who are here, the four, the six, the five, and the 10. And once I subtract all of those off, that's gonna leave me with 16 students. 16 students who are outside of my rings. They're one of the people I've surveyed but since they're outside of the A ring, that means they were successful in the course. They got A's, B's, or C's. Since they're outside of the C ring, that means they've never come to office hours. And since they're outside of the B ring, they're not studying two to three hours per unit. Maybe they're studying more. Maybe that's why they're able to not come to office hours. Or maybe they've taken the class before, they know some tricks, and so they, they know what to do. Who knows? But these 16 aren't part of my original thing. Notice something about this 16. I can't just come here and try to add up all the students earning F's and D's and students studying enough and students going to office hours because if I add 26 plus 21 plus 25, that's going to so get me a number that's bigger than 50, or excuse me, than 60. I don't know, it's going to give me what, 51, 52, 72? 
And that's going to be way more than the total number of students that I have. And that's because if I added up the 21 plus the 26 plus the 25, what I'm really doing is I'm double counting people. All these folks here in this region that I've highlighted, these ones that I've just highlighted are going to get counted twice if I'm adding up 26 plus 21 plus 25. And this 6 right here that I've sort of extra highlighted, he's getting counted up three times, because he's part of A, he's part of B, and he's part of C. And so when I add those up, that six is getting counted way too many times in terms of total number of people. So that's how you break this down in terms of seeing who's living in what based on my survey question of 60 students. The final thing that you really would want to do is come up with some sort of analysis and figure out what's really going on here. This is part of something that sometimes is called uh, data-driven decision-making. And you're trying to figure out, how can I help students? Well, let's first of all look at the, the students that I want to focus in on. Um, I, I don't really care, and that's kind of cold to say, but I don't really care about the ones who are outside of the A circle. They're the ones who are already passing the class. They're doing well on their own. I don't need to do any sort of intervention. Everything's good with them. Just keep on going how things are, and they'll continue to do perfectly fine. It's those 26 students who are earning D's and F's who I'm worried about, and they're going to break up into some different categories of people. First of all, let's talk about the nine. These nine, well, I should probably recommend to them that they try to study more. And I should also probably recommend to them that they come to office hours. They're not doing any of those things, and I might be able to get them into um, office hours and studying more. And if I did, they wouldn't be living in here anymore. Hopefully, they'd be living in one of these regions out here. They'd get outside the A column. Then there's the, the four people. These ones are coming to office hours, and they're also having trouble with the class, but they're still not studying enough. Not enough study. So I would recommend to those people that they try to do some more study and they need some more review. Repetition helps a lot in mathematics. Then I can look at the seven people here. Those seven are studying enough, they're putting in the time, and they're still having trouble in the class. These guys I would recommend office hours to. If you're trying to, to bang your head against something and it's not working, the answer is not to bang harder, come get me. Come to ask me questions. Somehow coming to office hours and letting uh, us talk it through and explaining something. There's, there's some concept that wasn't making sense in the lecture that I can help these people with. The last people I'm interested in um, are these six. These are the ones that still have trouble in class. They're in trouble. It's not going well for them. They are studying enough. They're putting in the time. And they're even getting my advice and coming to office hours. And so these are the ones that are particularly interesting to someone as an educator. And it's like, okay, how can I affect these students? How can I change this college experience and make it more positive? What is missing? Usually when you have people in this place, that's when I find that it's not so much something I can do as a teacher, but you know, you've got life problems. I don't know. You need to have two jobs. So while you're putting in the time to study, it's not maybe good quality study time because they're working two jobs and they're all tired. Or... You know, there's some sort of stress that's going on. So you start to look at things like that. So by asking a simple question, just three questions in fact, I'm able to come up with some pretty in-depth analysis of what I really think my at-risk students are going to be looking like and how I can do things to help. Obviously, maybe for some of them, like these six, there's not all that much I can do. Maybe I have to point them to other resources. But for some of these other ones, in fact, the vast majority of the 26 who are having trouble, we can do something. So now you're ready to solve survey type problems. This is how you do it. Remember, you'd go through it by doing subtraction. I think the book talks about survey subtract as a memory technique to remind you. You go about building it up through subtraction. And you get up all these separate little pieces. The number one mistake I see people make is in this region right here. They wouldn't just put the three. The students would be, uh, someone would be trying to plug in that 21 in there and then divvy it out, and that's not what you want. This region right here is unique. It's the students who are studying enough, and they're not having trouble in the class, and they're not coming to office hours. So that's a very specific place. 
The other thing people try to do is a usual mistake that you don't want to do. Don't add up the 26 plus 21 and 25. Instead, you have to take the 60 original people and subtract each of these regions from it. And that's where you get the 16 students who don't study for long enough and who don't come to office hours and they're still doing well in the class. Like I said, one example, maybe they're studying more than two to three hours. That might explain them.